Good morning. Uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker um, this morning, uh, at, who's sponsored by the uh, Center for Global Security Research. Uh, Ambassador Linton Brooks is very well known uh, to this community, to this laboratory. Um, he served as the NNSA Administrator from 2003 to 2007 um, and uh, is, is uh, um, re remembered as a great leader and a very careful steward um, uh, who's earned great respect and affection um, over the years. Um, now in retirement, uh, Linton's finally discovered something he's not very good at apparently. Um, he remains heavily engaged as an analyst, advisor, and mentor, and, and world traveler. Um, and I'm told that his wife, Barbara, might say he's overly engaged. Um, but I know he takes particular uh, pride and satisfaction in his role as a mentor to a new generation um, of, uh, of, of nuclear thinkers. Over the last decade, Linson has done more than any other individual to encourage, tutor, and inspire a new generation uh, of uh, nuclear scholars. Um, and today we're taking advantage of the fact that his mentoring duties have taken him to the West Coast for the past two weeks, um, uh, where he's the, um, the godfather of the, uh, uh, the PPNT, which is short for Public Policy and Nuclear Threats, um, sometimes called the Nuclear Boot Camp, which is held in, in San Diego each year. Um, it's attended by an international group of young men and women in early career positions um, and depends, hev depends heavily on Linton's personal commitment of time, energy, memory, and, uh, and storytelling capacity. Let's see, and in recognition of his unique commitment and gifts as a mentor, he was recognized in 2013 by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace with the Therese Del Pesce Memorial Award. Uh, he continues to advise the U.S. government on major policy issues. Um, among his other projects, he serves as a member of the State Department's International Security Advisory Board. Uh, he's chaired an ISAB study on policy towards Russia, a study that began before Russia's military-backed uh, annexation of Crimea, um, uh, which so it began before that and reported out um, uh, last uh, in December last year, uh, so covering covered obviously a very very tumultuous, uh, very interesting time, um, and uh, today he'll review that study and and talk a bit uh, about present and future the present and future of U.S. Russian relations. Um, and just I'll mention one one uh, um, other thing that I that I, I remember every time I I see him and talk to him. Um, there's a, um, when, when he was um, running NNSA, um, periodically I would get in my mailbox something called a lintgram. And I, I remember just being uh, incredibly, uh, it was just an amusing combination of term, words. It was, um, uh, and, and but, but it was inspiring, in fact. Uh, because uh, it led me, if any of you, if anyone here was in physics at the time, you might have periodically gotten a billboard, and that was actually inspired by the, Lin the Lindgram. <laughs> Just a bit of trivia, in case you were interested. Um, so before uh, joining me in welcoming Ambassador Brooks, um, just a few uh, uh, ground rules. The discussion here today will be on the record, just re so remember that. Um, it's uh, being video recorded for later posting um, on the web, uh, actually on the CGSR website. Um, and uh, the format will be that Linton will make some opening remarks and then we'll open it for questions and discussion. Um, I'd appreciate if you'd help us uh, keep the discussion focused on the topic of Russia and U.S. policy towards Russia. Um, if you have any other questions, use the Ask a Director um, uh, channel for that. With that, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Linton Brooks back to the laboratory. Thank you, Paul. So what you were supposed to think about with lint grams was they were unofficial and I wrote them myself. Uh, it is 
Always good to be back at Livermore. And it's particularly good to be back when neither the director nor I have to start with the two biggest lies in the system. I'm from Washington, I'm here to help you. I'm the lab director, I'm glad to see you. <laughs> so, the State Department International Security Advisory Board is a mixture of academics, former government officials that officially works for the Secretary of State and practically works for Rose Gottenmiller, who you, uh, some of you got to hear last week. And as a measure of how much things have changed, in 2013, she basically said, arms control is stalled, relations are pretty good, what can we do to build on this quiescent period um, and get some new areas of engagement until it's time for arms control again? So, a bunch of us are off, okay, sure, want that. And, and I'm chairing the study because, because I got told to chair the study. And the idea was, well, we'll look at, is there more we could do in the Arctic? Is there more we could do in science cooperation? And then Ukraine happened. And so, instead of being asked to focus on short-term ways to improve a basically relationship of partnership, we found ourselves thrust into managing a relationship or thinking about managing a relationship that threatened to become, and I would argue has become, increasingly adversarial and confrontational. So I'm going to talk to you about what our report said. Those of you who know me will understand that I'm going to editorialize next time. So if you are using the report, read the report, don't depend. I'll try and distinguish between what the report said and what I think, but I'm not always perfect at doing that. And so uh, read the report uh, because I will be embellishing in a couple of places. I'll try and make that clear. Well, the big deal in Washington then was what do we do in the near term? And advisory bodies are terrible at that because our time cycle is, is just too long uh, for an inherently tactical process. So basically, we, we recognize some principles for dealing with the Ukrainian crisis, and I think they're roughly right. Um, and the most important one was recognizing the significant anti-American component in the current Russian approach to the United States. Uh, and in fact, I would argue that 10 years from now, in a very bizarre way, there will have been seen to be one upside from the Ukrainian crisis. Because I think we've been in an adversarial relationship with the Russian Federation for about a decade. And because we didn't want that to be true, we didn't acknowledge that it was true. And I think Ukraine has forced us to look at a relationship that did not start with Ukraine and that uh, will not end if that crisis ever finds a resolution. So we, we said recognize that we're in a period of confrontation. Don't legitimize the changing of Ukraine's borders. Uh, or any future changing of borders by force. Maintain channels of communication, especially with the Russian military. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And we sort of endorsed um, most of the things the administration was doing, including a fairly well thought out strategy of not doing new things that look like business as usual, some of them involving the labs and the agreement that Moniz and Ross Adam had signed but not ending important areas of cooperation like New START, like the Iran talks. I read this morning a, result, a report from um, Deputy Foreign Minister Ribikov, who claims, and I think overstated perhaps, that um, Russia has been extremely helpful in the Iranian talks, and that is my understanding from people who've been in the table. 
So we, we wanted to keep cooperation where it made sense, but not do new initiatives that would look like we were legitimizing that. And that was the administration policy, and we liked that. We also argued this is not a nuclear crisis and that we shouldn't transform it into a nuclear crisis. And therefore, on the one hand, we should resist. A year and a half ago, there were people talking about, let's bring Poland more into nuclear planning. Let's, you know, there were a lot of expand the U.S. visible U.S. nuclear presence. And we thought that was a terrible idea. But at the same time, even though we were, as a group, widely, wildly divided on the long-term future of tactical weapons in Europe, we were unanimous that this was not the time to even talk about bringing them home, because it would be misinterpreted by our allies as a lessening of commitment in the face of Russian aggression, and it might be misinterpreted by Russia as a lack of willingness. And I'm going to talk about that a, a fair amount when I talk about the long-term thing. We also said, this is sort of committing truth in public, the annexation of Crimea was wrong, it was illegal, and it's probably not reversible. And just as we worked through the whole Cold War, never acknowledging that Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania were part of the Soviet Union, we will work through the next 20 years not acknowledging that Crimea is part of the, uh, of the Russian Federation, but I don't actually and we did not actually see any reasonable way to expect to bring it back. Let's talk about the long-term implications for strategic stability. And we were worried about two aspects of Russian military thinking. One is a growing belief in Russia and in the senior national security leadership in Russia, that the United States seeks to change the nature of the Russian government. And cabinet level Russians, speaking about this time last year, earlier spring of last year, said in essence that the democratic revolutions, the so called Orange Revolution in Czechoslovakia, the Velvet Revolution, were instigated by the United States, and they were in part intended as a dress rehearsal for doing something in Russia that would sweep the Putin regime from office. And secondly, the Russians appear to genuinely believe that the United States is seeking a first strike capability with respect to Russian strategic forces. Now, there is nothing, there is no definition of strategic stability that is likely to come to pass as long as the Russian Federation believes those things to be true. And I am convinced that the Russian Federation does believe those things to be true. An anecdote, me, not the advisory board. In the 80s, Russian leaders gave speeches about the fact that someday NATO would get together and attack. Now, Brad Roberts used to coordinate NATO, and he will tell you that it's difficult to get NATO to agree on what time the meeting starts. And the idea that they're going to join arms and march to Moscow um, was fanciful. And guys like me said, that's not only propaganda, it's crude and stupid propaganda because they can't possibly believe it. When the wall came down and we got access to some of the Russian archives, Soviet archives, before a lot of that closed down, we discovered that, yeah, a lot of them did believe it, that uh, they actually thought that someday NATO would attack. My point is, and this is anecdote, not data, and I admit that, that we should not assume, even though they're perfectly capable of lying, that when they express fears of the United States, they are lying, or at least that all of them are lying, because I don't think that's true. 
And I don't know what we do about that. Simple statements by the United States that we have no intention of trying to overthrow the Putin government and that we have no intention of trying to gain a first strike capability are not going to be enough because the Russians won't believe them. They assume that all governments lie. After all, they grew up in the Soviet era when the government lied and, you know, the Putin administration is not entirely uh, consistent with the truth in some of its public pronouncements. But it also reflects a distrust of America, and that's a concern. So we clearly need something to help the Russians understand that we do not seek to threaten their existence as a state, uh, and I don't know what that is, and we didn't either. It's easy to think on the first strike question of confidence building measures would actually help the Russians. Unfortunately, anything you can think of that would help the Russians, I, I doubt any U.S. administration would be willing to do. Ballistic missile defense is the obvious example. Ballistic missile defense in Europe is aimed at Iran. We will see. I note that the, they haven't set a new date, but they've extended the talks as of this morning. Uh, but the talks are not going to take away the Iranian ballistic missile threat. Uh, and I think it's very unlikely that the talks are going to lead to us ending the phase adaptive approach of ballistic missile defense in Europe. That is, once again, me, not the ISAB. Uh, and further, doing that in some kind of arms control thing, I think, is inconsistent with U.S. interests and completely non-negotiable um, by an administration of either party. So while I can think of things, and you might read Steve Pfeiffer's book, uh, The Agenda, uh, for examples of things you could do, I can't think of anything that we will do or that we should do. Now, the flip side of this, of course, is that we need much better convincing that Ukraine is an aberration they regret and not a template for their future foreign relations. I don't quite know how they do that. So we have the first thing to understand about our relationship with the Russian Federation over the coming years is that both of us have deeply seated suspicions that I don't know an easy way to get around. Second thing, if you want a stable relationship, you have to be able to manage crisis and prevent their escalation. In both U.S. and Russian, but particularly I think Russian, military modernization and doctrinal innovations have made this more complicated. We were particularly concerned with what the December 2014 Russian military doctrine, which came out after we um, completed our work, it calls pre-nuclear deterrence. And there is a strong possibility that each side will take steps in a crisis that the other, that it intends to show resolve and restraint and that the other side interprets as escalation. What can we do about that? Well, our solution is that we really need serious, not ritualistic, high-level military-to-military discussions. Um, focused in particular on escalation management. That's probably not on, and so I'll tell you in a little bit about what our, our fallback was. Third thing, strategic stability requires a continued U.S. focus on Russia and Central Europe. Now that sounds obvious, uh, and it, you know, it's easy for me to say because I'm talking to you about Russia. But the problem is 
the top leadership in the United States can focus on anything, but they can't focus on everything. And the Middle East demands an immense amount of focus. I think that the President is right, the long-term future of the United States, this century, will be dominated by the relationship between the United States and the People's Republic of China. So shifting more emphasis to the Pacific is, is probably a pretty good idea. How you can believe both of those things and say pay more attention to NATO and Central Europe, we didn't exactly help you with. We just said don't forget NATO and Central Europe. But that caution is for all levels of government. If NATO and Central Europe are relegated to the mid-levels of the bureaucracy, no matter how thoughtful, and ignored by the Cabinet and the White House, we will not like the way this comes out. Finally, if you want strategic stability, you need a stable Ukraine. We, uh, we said we need an internally cohesive, democratic, and economically viable Ukraine. Well, yeah. Speaking for me, again, not the ISAB, we don't have any idea how to do that. There's a quite good piece recently by Matt Rajansky from the Kennan Institute that talks about uh, Ukraine, and it talks in particular about the need to reform the internal system. Uh, Ukraine is basically an incompetent and to some extent corrupt government. Uh, and what you'd like to believe is you can have a world in which Ukraine is like Finland, an integrated state that is naturally respectful to its large neighbor, but strong enough so that it won't be pushed around and maintains good enough ties with the West that if all else fails, there's an association there. But Finland is not Ukraine. And we don't know how to make Ukraine into a stable thing. This is quite apart from questions about whether it should be neutral, whether it should affiliate with NATO. We did not get in to uh, that. The U.S. position is pretty clear. The NATO position is pretty clear. The Wales Summit explicitly said Ukraine will be a member of NATO. The Wales Summit wisely did not put a date on when uh, that would happen. So the biggest loose end I think that we left the department in our recommendations is what to do about Ukraine, and that was simply because we don't know. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, cooperation in the misty future where we've solved Ukraine. I'll be happy to talk about that if anybody wants, but that's far enough in the future, so I'm not sure it's useful. Now let's get into the more direct military issues. Ukraine's not a NATO member. Military action is not appropriate. We're arguing about lethal assistance uh, on, in defensive weapons, but nobody is arguing that we need to come to the defense of Ukraine. They're not an ally. They're not a member of NATO. But we don't want President Putin and his advisors to believe that the same measured reaction, sanctions, non-lethal aid, would be what we would do in the case of aggression against a NATO member. Is that fanciful? I hope so. But if Russia misjudges the willingness of the United States and our NATO allies to live up to their North Atlantic Treaty Article 5 responsibilities in the case of aggression against a NATO member, that would be a very bad thing. Now there's no evidence that Russia contemplates such a move, and I personally doubt it. But our track record on predicting Russian behavior since the end of the Cold War is mixed at best. I mean, two years ago, if I stood in front of an audience of Russian experts and said, um, you know, Russia's going to annex Crimea by uh, essentially force dressed up uh, as a referendum, people would have said, well, yeah, that's an interesting worst-case scenario, but of course that won't happen. So our track record 
on predicting Russian behavior is poor. So I think we have to pay a lot of attention, and I think NATO is paying some attention intellectually. We'll get to that in a second. Um, because strategic stability will be undermined if either Russia or our NATO allies come to doubt U.S. resolve to defeat those allies. Another aside not to be ascribed to the board, think about it. The Russian public rationale is that somehow Russians as an ethnic group have been disrespected and oppressed throughout the world and that it is the Moscow government's responsibility to look out for ethnic Russian interests wherever they are challenged. And in some of the Baltic states, there are a large number of Russian speakers. Most of them have no interest in having Mama Russia come in and take over and help them, but they are Russian speakers and not all of them uh, feel that they are fully accepted in their states. So if President Putin used that as an excuse to do something like he was done in Ukraine, what does the United States do? Well, we meet our Article 5 responsibilities under NATO, and we are now at war with the only country on the planet that can unambiguously destroy us as a functioning society before the end of our session this morning. That doesn't seem like a good idea. Or we don't come to their aid and put at doubt the entire basis of post-World War II U.S. security planning, which is strong alliances with the United States as the strongest guarantor of those alliances. That's a whole different world, not one I think we would like. So the way you avoid that is make sure it doesn't happen, and the way you make sure it doesn't happen is help the Russians see that they'll get the first option, they'll get strong U.S. reaction. So the rotational deployment of forces into the Central European states. We can argue about whether in a, if this goes on for a long time we'll want to make that formally permanent, but rotating forces is important. The U.S. planned billion dollar fund to bolster European security and reassure allies. See how much that money actually shows up in real budgets, but it's a good thing. We should look now at the costs, the missions, the consequences of permanent stationing. It's premature to do permanent stationing, but it's not premature to think about what that might mean. Crimea was really pretty well done. As a, as a case of taking over a big chunk of country in what is now being called in Washington at least hybrid warfare. And we've not thought about that within NATO, or we had not, we we're doing more thinking about it now, but we had not at the time of our study, because that requires a combination of internal and external security responses. And in most of our NATO states, those are different communities. I mean, look how much trouble we have had in Washington in integrating homeland security and external security into coherent planning. And we're a mature democracy that wasn't trying to do this uh, primarily driven by huge budget austerity. So our NATO allies have a complex problem, and NATO needs to start thinking through what it will do to have a counter strategy to that kind of hybrid warfare, conceptually anywhere but practically in the three Baltic states. That's very different from anything that NATO's done. It involves different agencies, different countries, different thought patterns. Now is the time to do that thinking. Finally, we think that strategic stability 
cru in the future crucially depends on Russia honoring it or believing that NATO will honor its Article 5 commitments and NATO allies believing the U.S. is ready. Rhetorically, there can be no doubt. In the Wales summit last year, you could not ask for stronger words about the unacceptability of Russian action. You could not ask for stronger words about the termination of NATO. You could not ask for stronger commitments that all of NATO was going to make it clear that they cared by increasing defense budgets universally to 2% of gross domestic product. Could not ask for more. You have to look a long time before you see any actual budget increases. Early days yet, I understand budget processes you take a long time. I used to do that for a living. But I am worried that as this fades into what President Putin obviously would like it to fade into, another frozen conflict, like the one with the Transnistria Republic in Moldova and the few Russian soldiers there, like the one in Georgia with two parts of Georgia as independent states recognized by Russia and nobody else on the planet. As this becomes another frozen conflict with Western Ukraine in some kind of ambiguous statement, or in some ways even worse, what the Russians have said they think the solution is a new Ukrainian constitution that gives the regions essentially veto over government decisions. Think Articles of Confederation in the United States where all 13 of our states had to agree. And you see how well that worked by the fact that we junked it after about 10 years. But that's sort of the Russian, some Russians, goal for Ukraine. As we move there, will NATO consume with things like Greece and the Eurozone, um, consumed with how fast can they get out of responsibility for Afghanistan without angering the United States, consumed with the fact that while the states that are really close to Russia see a Russian threat, the states that are closer to the Atlantic actually don't see a Russian threat, probably because there isn't a physical threat to their countries. As that goes on, is NATO going to be able to maintain resolve? And I think the biggest, one of the big long-term uh, strategic security challenges is um, how we maintain this over time and across administrations. Our track record on this as a country is not particularly good. You know, until they rectified their aggressive action in Georgia, we would not deal with the Russian Federation. You know, I mean, there are serious Americans in 2008 who talked that way. But perfectly sensible decisions about overall national interests got made. And I fear perfectly sensible decisions will get made by our NATO allies and perhaps by ourselves um, that, well, increasing the NATO budget is a, one of many good things and we can't have everything. Who knows? Uh, before I, we turn to questions, I want to talk about two particular uh, special topics. <laughs> You, some of you got to hear Rose Gottemuller. Um, she commissioned this study. It will therefore not surprise you that she asked us to pay particular attention to the role of arms control. And so we thought about that a little bit. And here's what we concluded, none of which I think should surprise you. Um, first, Bad things seldom happen one at a time. Just as we were dealing with Ukraine, we were also dealing with the U.S. public acknowledgement of something it had known for a while, which is 
that the United States believes that the Russian Federation is in violation of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty of 1987. Now that treaty is about delivery systems and it bans delivery systems that are ground-based ballistic missile or cruise missile that have a range of 500 to 5,500 kilometers. Historical reason for all those things, but at the moment the important thing is its treaty. The United States believes the Russians are violating it, but has been remarkably reticent about explaining why it believes that. I presume that is for sources and methods reasons, that's usually what it is. But the United States is convinced it is shared enough with the Russian Federation so they know exactly what we're talking about. The Russian Federation has taken a page out of its Soviet predecessor. We are doing nothing wrong and oh by the way we have a list of things we're really uh, worried about that you're doing that we'd like to bring up. Uh, and so they brought up three specific charges, one of which is an older charge, the other two are brand new and I think largely without merit. So um, what should we do about that? And our answer was, because it was sloshing around Washington at the time, we should not withdraw from the INF Treaty. It was not in the U.S. interest to withdraw from the INF Treaty. There is nothing we would like to do that we are likely to be able to afford to do that the INF Treaty prevents us from doing. And uh, we should continue to press Russia and we should do exactly what we are doing, which is craft military countermeasures that are consistent with the INF Treaty uh, if this thing gets deployed. We believe it to be a long range ground launch cruise missile. Second, we need greater confidence that NATO won't use Ukraine as some kind of a staging for doing something aggressive against Russia, and that Russia won't use the current unrest as a pretense for a broader invasion of Ukraine. Neither of those are likely, but, so there's a thing called the Vienna Document, which provides for uh, regional military liaison uh, monitoring missions. We suggested that some of the cooperating uh, monitoring center uh, techniques developed at Sandia, uh, Sandia Albuquerque, uh, for deployment along the border might be considered. Uh, we called for an agreement to demonstrate that there are no NATO nuclear weapons in Ukraine and no Russian nuclear weapons in Crimea. Uh, don't hold your breath till the Russians agree to that. I, we, uh, there's no public information that there are nuclear weapons in Crimea and I sort of doubt there are. If I come back here five years, I sort of doubt there won't be because the Russians have stressed that it would be completely within their rights and suggested the military mission such weapons uh, would uh, take and I, my guess is that, that we will see them there. The facilities, I am told, are in terrible shape so it's not a question of there's really storage facilities all ready to go but we'll see. We need to flesh out the concept of what role arms control has in Ukraine. And finally, you all know that there's no Russian appetite for new arms control treaties right now. We believe, I believe, and most of us believe, but this is me, the Russians don't like it when there's no treaty regulating the strategic balance between our two countries. As we get closer to the expiration of New START, they will want something. That'll be late in the first term of the next president and early in the first term of the next president, we should start thinking seriously about what we want. And we will have a you know, we will have a very elaborate agenda and they will have a very elaborate agenda, but our argument was whatever else happens, we need to preserve the transparency and monitoring provisions of New START. Easiest way is to pick up the option in the treaty for a five-year extension, that's not the only way. It is in the U.S. interest to maximize uh, 
our understanding of what's going on. My colleague Frank Miller has a wonderful line, and, and those of you who know Frank uh, know that he is not what you would call a big champion of arms control, but um, transparency leads to predictability and predictability leads to stability. And he's absolutely right on that. So the third arms control thing is we need to continue that regime. And it is very, and it's hard, it's hard to find an upbeat thing in here, but one of them is that uh, after a little flurry of Russian press about, well, maybe we should withdraw from New START, and a very unfortunate provision in the House passed National Defense Authorization Act that we should, with, we should stop implementing New START. Um, neither the grown-ups on both sides appear to have decided this is in our mutual interest, largely because it is. Last topic is unofficial dialogues. One lesson of the Cold War, I believe, and we believed, is that unofficial dialogue is most useful when official dialogue is thwarted by tensions. And therefore, we think we need to really push continuing, or in many cases, resuming some of the channels of unofficial dialogue. Now, that's hard, and it's hard because Russian participants right now may be reluctant, particularly in any public way, to go beyond approved talking points. You know, if you'd looked at the track record of what has happened to visible opponents of the present regime, they have a, they have a tendency to end up dead. And of course, each of those is explained by the Russian Federation as a criminal act by somebody entirely um, unconnected with the Russian government, and that may be true, but nonetheless, they're dead. So our problem in a robust and serious official dialogue should not, or unofficial dialogue, should not be minimized. So what do we do about that? Well, one thing is these have to be very low visibility dialogues. We cannot come home and give press releases that say, you know, Russian experts from the Institute of the USA in Canada or IMIMO or some university in, in uh, uh, Central Asia uh, say this or that, because that will not facilitate it. But it's important, and we would focus unofficial dialogue engagement in four areas. First, is the problem of miscalculation in the crisis. We want, Steve Pfeiffer has recently published a very well received piece uh, arguing how important it is to have military to military discussions about escalation management. And I think the best way to do that is with serving military officers and serving senior defense officials. I don't see that happening. Therefore, I think we need to find the best surrogate for that, and the best surrogate for that is not, in my view, primarily academics, although there is a role for academics, but high-level, thoughtful senior military officers on both sides. There are people do that, and the object is very clear, to make sure that we don't escalate ourselves into a serious crisis because of misinterpreting how sensible acts by us would be misperceived by the other side and vice versa. Second area is, I've argued sooner or later we're going to come to a time when the Russians will be willing to talk about arms control again. Uh, when that happens, it would be nice if we were ready to have that discussion. We are not now ready to have that discussion. Uh, the Russians have made it very clear there are some very specific things they're worried about, and nobody, to the best of my knowledge, in the United States is working on some of those. Mostly have to do with the relation of conventional, what they call conventional strategic weapons. Um, but 
we need to think very seriously about this and take advantage of the fact that nothing is going to happen in the next few years to spend some intellectual capital. Third thing is I said early in these remarks that we were worried that the Russians genuinely think that we're out to get them. So we need to reassure the Russians. Well, the experts on what reassure Russians are Russians. And so a quiet engagement on that topic might be useful. And finally, Russia is going to be there for a long time. Russia matters. Russia matters because, as I said earlier, it's the only country that can destroy us as a functioning society unquestioningly. It matters because it's a UN Security Council veto in a world in which that is increasingly going to be seen in reaction to some of the coalition of the willing things of the last 10 years as useful. It matters because it is the only country in the world that has very serious interests in the Pacific, the Middle East, and Europe besides us. So there's no future in which Russia won't matter. And therefore, we need to look at the rising generation of Russians. We need something modeled in some way on the people-to-people -people dialogue of decades ago. And that's going to be hard because survey data shows that the rising generation of Russians are deeply nationalistic, deeply anti-American, and far too willing to accept some of the unsavory history of the Soviet Union as a time of greatness. So polls show young Russians believe Stalin did more good than harm. Uh, you get the idea. The, one of the reasons that I spent a lot of my time, as the director was kind enough to mention, on mentoring the next generation is we've got to have somebody over here who doesn't look like their grandfather who was talking to the rising generation. And so we need collectively to foster that community, but specifically try and engage that. We made one more uh, recommendation on unofficial talks. Everybody in government always thinks, oh, I ought to be able to orchestrate non-government organizations doing this and that, and they're all nuts. I mean, they call them non-government organizations for a reason. It is foolish to think that in the American system we can control what form of engagement happens between U.S. citizens and Russian citizens. It is not foolish to say we ought to get benefit of that. So we advocate the State Department establish an office with a firm responsibility of finding out all discussions, National Academy of Science, this new thing that I'm involved with, with, with a, a Russian researcher who's trying to get 20 of us together to look at implementation of Iran, some of the stuff that different think tanks are going, and simply ask for debriefs and collect that knowledge systematically. Uh, and, and that will, I think, help us to do that. So that's our report with some editorializing. Uh, what's the takeaway for you? Well, at one level, the takeaway is hard because it tells you that we are in a period of tension and confrontation. Most people reject the term new Cold War. I sort of, just like we talk about the Cold War and the new nuclear age, I think what's happening may, may rise to the level of being a new, called a new Cold War. It's dramatically different from the old Cold War in many ways, most of them good. Um, but, but it's not different in terms of, I think, the depth on the Russian side of suspicion.
So you're going to be faced with a future in which cooperation with the Russian labs is largely going to be symbolic and difficult. You're going to be faced with a future in which there's a great deal of suspicion. Uh, you're not going to be faced with a future in which uh, vast changes to the U.S. nuclear arsenal are seen as the solution. And so you're going to need to work hard to find ways to contribute to both this unofficial engagement, which we have to depend on until we, you know, the wheel turns again and there's another possibility, but also to helping the country think through the problems we've tried to outline, but none of us on the State Department Advisory Board is dumb enough to think that we have uh, come anywhere close. And with that, I look forward to your questions, comments, rebuttals, whatever. Thanks.